decade of the 2020s has been quite the journey for us as the Lord has given us a focused word for the decade. And that word is greater. Greater influence of God in our life, in the community, and in the world. And each year, the Lord has given us a different word to go along with greater, to emphasize and focus on. In 2021, it was greater breakthrough. In 2022, it was greater harvest. In 2023, it was greater presence. And in 2024, the word for the year, greater growth. Greater growth in our relationship with God. Greater growth in our marriages. Greater growth in our parenting. Greater growth in our influence in the community and in the world. I'm getting fired up. Join us Sunday, October 29th, where we will share the vision for the areas that we believe God is calling us to grow in 2024. And let me just say, 2023 was a great year. We truly feel that God used us to expand his kingdom and we're just getting started. Church, I am live and in the flesh at the Queen Creek Performing Arts Center. And I want you to mark your calendars for October 29th, where we are going to host our Greater Growth Worship Night. Our three congregations are going to come together like Voltron, and we're going to worship the Lord together. 777 seats filled up. Get more details on the app today. Immediately following our Greater Growth Worship Night, we will be launching a 21-day devotional emphasizing greater growth in our spiritual lives. There is nothing more important than for us to be unified together under the banner of Christ, drawing nearer to Him. This is why it's such a big deal for us to join together and do this as a family. The devotional will be available on the Bethel app and you can join us every day at 714 for a devotional devoted to this journey. Good morning, Bethel. Good morning, Bethel Sunrise, as they, we are streaming right now this portion of our, our sermon together. So good morning, Pastor Preston and all the wonderful people over at Bethel Sunrise. Uh, today we begin a new series. Last week uh, we ended a series entitled Endgame as we examined the last days. And uh, pretty amazing that God would instruct us back in the spring as we were praying about our summer series and fall series that God would have us in a series talking about the last days. I don't know about you, but if you spend any time online or in media, you'll hear a lot of people talking about the last days. Um, you got even Joe Rogan freaking out this week about all that's going on in the world. And let me tell you, God wishes for none to perish, but all to come to know him. His promise is that he is slow to his return so that everyone who will and could will receive Jesus. And um, so what I know, Bethel, is this. When Jesus returns, which I don't know when he's going to return, but when he does, at least for us in our house, he's going to find faith. Luke chapter 18, verse 8, Jesus says, When the Son of Man returns, will he find faith in the earth? Well, for me in my house, for me in this house, Bethel, he's going to find some faith. Amen? Not fear. Not fear. I mean, this is our moment when the world's full of fear. The world's freaking out. But we know we're getting closer to that most glorious day of his return. And we don't know exactly when it is. I'm not even trying to figure it out, okay? I I don't got my head up in the clouds, okay? I got my hand to the plow. We've got our hands to the plow. And those of you that have taken your hands off, it's time to get your hands back on the plow. Because what does it mean when the Son of Man returns? Will he find faith? He'll find men and women 
sons and daughters who have their hands on the plow, that are about his business, that are about being a disciple, not just a Christian. So as you came in, uh, you were given a handout. And uh, so we've got two sermons for you today, and we got two worship sets. Uh, for these next six weeks, during this Connect offering time, which I want to encourage you to reach for, grab a Connect card if you have a prayer request, grab an offering envelope. In a moment, we'll uh, receive both of those uh, at both campuses, and we're glad you're joining us. Next week, we're going to be joining you for this moment. Uh, and then we're going to have worship at the end. We're going to have a, we're going to have a testimony after I share a little bit, and then, then we're going to have worship. And we're going to do this for the next six weeks. We're changing things up. Because the Lord said, change it up. So we're following him. Because it's not about us and our agenda. It's about his. And we're just doing our best at following him. Amen? So if you have your Bibles, turn to Acts chapter 1. It's the beginning and the birth of the church. And the book of Acts is an interesting book. It has no ending. There's no logical ending. I remember years ago, I was reading through the book of Acts, and I came to the end, and I had read the book of Acts many, many, many times, and uh, I just had kind of forgotten how it ended. And then I, I read through it, and I thought, I'm, I think I'm missing a page, Doug, <laughs> like, because it just stops. There's no closure to it, and there's a reason for that, because Acts is not stopped being written. We are the acts. Yes. And it's still being written. Heaven is keeping account and writing yes. our story. This is our time, church. This is our time to be alive yes. and to live yes. and to make a difference. Yes. Let's not squander it. Let's not waste it on things that will just burn up and matter for nothing. You know, these moments where everything is shaken and there's wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes and all those things, these are just birth pains. Now, those birth pains may last decades, hundreds of years, or they may last just a few more moments. Well, we've decided we're going to be ready. We're going to be ready for his return, and we're going to build like he's going to take a little bit longer. We can do both. We can do both simultaneously. In fact, you must do both. Because if you don't, then you give up. You give up on things. You kept building. And many, many gave up hundreds of years ago. Gave up on the universities. Gave up on the schools. Gave up on institutions. And, and who's running them now? Not Christians. Not disciples. So what did Jesus say in Acts chapter 1? He says... Verse 4, and being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise for the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. We got any people baptized in the Holy Ghost in the house today? Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? Are you at this time coming back? The early church asked that question. Are you coming now? Is this the second coming? Are you now going to establish your kingdom? Is this, it? Is this the time? Listen, 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 Linda. <laughs> listen, church. His answer is stay the same today. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, are you going to, at this time we're going to restore the kingdom of heaven? He said to them, it is not, it is not, it is not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority. It's amazing. We're all the world events. We might be really close, you guys. But guess what? As close or as far as we are, you're not to know. No one is. Hello, read your Bible. Stop trying to figure it out. Stop getting your head up in the clouds. Get your hand on the plow. And let's bring the kingdom of God here. He's going to come when he comes. But are you ready for him to come? Because if your heads are in the clouds trying to 
find out when he's coming, guess what? You're not ready. He's called you to walk by faith. I mean, imagine it. If we took the time that so many Christians take in trying to figure out and getting on the news and all of that, and you just actually went over and loved your neighbor with that time and passion. You don't need another book on all the reasons Jesus is going to return this year. Because they're wrong. Because nobody knows. Yes, this might be a rebuke for some of you. Stop getting freaked out. It's just ridiculous. I mean, so many Christians are like, they think the rapture is coming soon, and then they're storing up all this food in their guns. For what? You believe in a rapture? Come on. What has he called us to do? He's called us to grow his kingdom until he returns. And that's our word for the coming year, greater growth. We're going to grow until he returns. There's three critical steps to greater growth as a disciple of Jesus. And yes, that's what he wants from you. And it goes on and it says you will receive power. And then in verse 9 it says, when they had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up And a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadily toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them with white, who said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken from you into heaven will come to you like this manner as you saw him go to heaven. So these angels go, what are you guys doing? I think if you, you would hear the angels in your life, they're going, what are you doing? Get off YouTube trying to figure out when he's coming. Get off the media. Stop getting your heads in the clouds. You're no good up there. I've got you here. You're, this is our life. There's a time we're going to be caught up in the heavens. Y'all, it's our time now to live by faith, not fear. This is an exciting time. The world's freaking out, and I love it. Because we got the answer to their fear. Jesus is. Yes, he's coming back, and you should be concerned about that. Praise the Lord. But I'm not. And if you have Jesus and you're a disciple, you shouldn't. You should long for that day. Whatever your plans for are here on earth, and have some plans. When he comes back, his plans will be way better than your plans. You're not giving up anything. Don't be afraid. Well, I won't get to it. No, there's so much more. This is the closest to hell us Christians will ever get. Three critical steps to greater growth as a disciple. Discipleship is the foundation of Christian leadership. You know, you can be a leader and not a disciple. In fact, some of the greatest problems I've ever had during the 15 years of pastoring the church have been from leaders who weren't disciples. I mean, you see leaders, right? And you see leaders, you go, man, they got charisma, they got influence. And man, you know, we want to see them be used by God to influence people for good. But man, have I made a mistake over and over again, trusting things to leaders who weren't disciples. And it's only burnt me. Because there's a difference. There's a difference. You can be a leader and not a disciple. What is a disciple? Disciple is all about obedience. It's obeying Jesus. A disciple learns to do these three things by hearing and obeying God. Number one, they love Jesus. They learn to love Jesus more. What else? To love others. They grow. They get greater at growing, loving others. And then they grow in living on mission. On mission. To live on mission. Again, as I said earlier, leadership is influence. But Christian leadership is influenced by service and sacrifice. Service and sacrifice. So many times leaders... 
They, they, they want to lead because they, they, they want that position to be over people, to tell people what to do. But Christian leadership is about serving others. The higher God raises you up in Christian leadership, the more service and sacrifice that is required. And God wants us to grow in that, all of us to grow in that. So these are the three critical steps. Mark chapter 1, verse 14. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel, saying, The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Passing along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew and the brother Simon casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. Number one critical step that never stops being taken by a Christian or a disciple who is growing is you never stop repenting and believing. It's called salvation. And our salvation, yes, is secure, but we are being saved. The Bible teaches we're saved, but we are being saved. Our soul is being saved. We're being made more into his image, okay? This is what greater growth is in salvation. And the way you do that is repenting of those things that don't look like Jesus. Repenting of it. Repenting of it. And then believing what he says about you and obeying that. Number two, follow me. It's about separation. So first one is salvation. We're being saved. And let me just say this about our greater change, our greater uh, growth here. It's not about going from, from good to great. It's not about going from bad to good. It's about going from death to life. Number two, follow me, separation. Have you separated from the world? Again, if you were on trial today in, in a court of law, would there be enough evidence to convict you of being a Christian? Would your friends, would your colleagues, would your neighbors, would there be enough evidence that they could convict you in a court of law that you were a disciple, a Christian? That's something to be thought of. Are you being accused because you've separated yourself, not from not caring about the world, but not living like the world? We're still in this world to reach it, but not to be like it. Jesus was with the world, but he never came into the, to the practices of the world. He was always separate. And number three, to become fishers of men. We've got to incorporate. It's about incorporation. Have you incorporated into the mission of the church? Do you know that Jesus isn't coming back for individuals? He's coming back for the church who are full of individuals. Okay, American Christianity, I, I need, you need to be helped here. It's not about your independent me and Jesus. It's not the, just John Wayne. He ain't coming back for John Wayne's. He's coming back for a family, a bride. I mean, imagine this. Jesus comes back, and you're not a part of his church. Well, pastor, or rather, well, Jesus, you know, you know that I just got hurt, got my feelings hurt, and I just stopped going to church. There are people dying for their faith all the world. And you can't get over your feelings. They got hurt. You know, pastor, you know, he was just, he shouted a little too much today. <laughs> Come on. Y'all, we're warriors. We're called to be disciples. Was Jesus nice? No, he wasn't nice. You read your Bible. Okay, if you think Jesus is nice, you've got the wrong Bible. Or you're not reading your Bible. Jesus is not nice. He tells the rich young ruler, hey, go sell everything you have, then you can follow me. Is that nice? 
Can you imagine that? Oh my gosh, pastor, you just, you just told that rich person that he needs to go sell everything? Well, that's what Jesus said. I haven't said it, but maybe I should. You can't serve God and money. Jesus says it's harder for a rich man to go through the eye of a needle than for him to enter into the kingdom. You know, back in the Middle Ages, we, we made up this thing about a gate and a needle. That it was just made up. And I, I took it because I taught it at the time. It was made up. There was this place called the eye of a needle that entered into a city. And it was really hard, and you had to get off the camel. And pull. It was made up. It was made up in the Middle Ages. It didn't exist. There is no thing that was a, a camel through. It, Jesus meant what he said. It is impossible. But he said this, all things are possible for him who believes. Jesus wasn't nice. He was kind and loving, but not nice. Read your Bible. He calls us to repent. I know we don't like that. We drive by the person on the street corner, you know, just this caricature that says, repent for the kingdom. You know, we're just like, uh, you know what? That's how the early church preached in the open. I'm not saying that's the most effective way, but I'm just saying that repent is not this, you know, like, oh, I got empathy for you. You know, I got empathy because you're so confused and da, da, da. You know what? Empathy has become an idol. That is not helping anybody. It's a call to repent. Not, oh, it's okay, I understand that you're so confused. No, 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 repent, because I love you. Because you are a boy. You are a girl. That's the most loving thing you can tell somebody. And somebody who's confused about that, all you say is repent. Repent. Church, it's time to be the church. It's time to start being what Jesus called us to be, which is disciples. It's time to grow up. And that's what we're going to do. A loving, compassionate church that cares so much about people, we're going to tell them the truth. And the truth is this. And yes, we're streaming this. The truth is this. If you die without Jesus, you're going to hell. May not be politically correct, but it is correct. It's the truth. And he and I wish for none to perish, but all to come to know him. As the day gets closer, guys, we got to grow up. We got to be disciples. We're not called to be Christians. We're called to be disciples, which means a disciplined person. Amen. A year ago, in April, I had on my vision board that I wanted to be debt free. So that was my main focus first, was our credit cards. And so we were able to pay $8,500 worth of credit cards in one year. I kind of looked back at some of the payments that we had made, and I just saw $600 going to one credit card, $800 going to another credit card, and we just started dumping money in our credit cards that we had just built up. Mainly me, I think they were my credit cards. Did I already say that? They were my credit cards. But um, we, my husband and I, have paid them off. So in one year, paid off five credit cards. So one of the things that was my focus was not just paying off the credit cards, but also to be a giver. So going through my divorce in 2016, when it was final, I was very fearful with my money. I never had to be fearful in the 22 years that I was married because provided for, didn't pay my bills, didn't really see the money. That's just how everything was. It was fine. It was great. It was awesome. But I never felt it. And so having to do finances myself, I was feeling the pain of this is what you have and this is what you're supposed to give. This is your tithe. Are you going to give your tithe, Melissa? And it, it was a struggle for me. And I was that reluctant giver that the Bible talks about. And so I just cried and I asked the Lord, please forgive me. I don't want to be reluctant. I don't want to not trust you. I don't want to be fearful. I want to believe and trust that I'm going to be okay when I give you my finances. When I give, I believed it all these years. Now, why can't I do it, you know, in my life? So I did. I started tithing. So my word last year was give. 
And so I started giving even before that I was tithing. But also there was people in my life that came in contact with me that needed money, that needed an extra $150 or $100 for this. And I was able to give and I didn't feel reluctant. I didn't feel like, wow, maybe someone else should give to them. But I knew God was calling me to do it. And it was a blessing. It was a huge blessing. And I feel like even with the greater harvest giving at Bethel Sunrise for breakfast, um, Pastor Mike was talking to a lot of the leaders and was telling them, some of you here are gonna give $5,000 for Greater Harvest. And in my mind, I thought, wow, good for them. <laughs> That's great, <laughs> they should. <laughs> God's gonna bless them, you know? But when we left that meeting, my husband Steve looked at me and said, we're gonna give 5,000. And I was like, okay. I knew it, I knew it was God. I knew he wanted me to because I was, I was already thinking it was for other people, not for me. So when my husband said that, I said, you're so right. I believe that. We can do it. And so my wheels started turning. I started thinking, how are we going to do that? So we were able to give a certain amount last year for by December, a good chunk of it. And then also we're able to pay the rest of our greater harvest giving that we um, pledged to. We get to finish it this week and complete the 5000 that we pledged to give. So I know God was working. I know He's been moving on my heart to give. I, I trust Him. The Bible says to give and it'll be given back to you, pressed down, shaken together and running over. And so if I don't live it, it's not gonna come out in my life. Oh, there could be some excitement in the house because usually I close out the service, but today uh, that's not happening. So with that, buckle up, um, we're going to go for a little bit of a ride. Um, before you do, you know, I was kind of going through some, uh, I was meeting with some people on Friday, and uh, Pastor Julie was part of the group, and we were walking down the sidewalk, and she says, so how are things going? Are, are you ready? And I says, yeah, I really, I believe God has given me a word, and I'm, I'm just entrusting it to him. She goes, now do you have your outfit picked out? So in that moment, all of my theological training went sideways, and I go, I guess it's really about... Anyway, just maybe something to consider. This morning, I just want to um, start our uh, Blessed series, and I'm really excited about this because it's very passionate on my heart. Actually, through the discussion of what we are, or the, the sermon that I have prepared for you, um, something spoke to my spirit over the last couple of three weeks, and um, I believe this is my life message. Amen. And um, so we're going to spend a good amount of time here in the future developing that in so many ways, because when we take and look at Scripture through the lens of generosity, it's amazing how many times it speaks to us about how generous our God is. And it is just amazing when we see him for who he truly is and not these small... Um, distorted ideas of what the world has taught us our God is. He's not small-minded. He's not judgmental. He is quite the opposite because God so loved, he gave his only son. How can that be a stingy, angry God? Part of the reason I am here is because there is a young lady on the front row at the mere age of 83 that has prayed me to this point. You're going to hear a little of my story in a bit. I want to first and foremost honor her. And uh, in more cases than not, I am the man that I am because of the prayers that she has prayed over the years. And if you're a mother, don't lose heart. Don't lose heart. The best is yet to come. Amen. I want to thank Pastor Mike and Julie also real quickly and um, uh, the grace that they've shown me and my wife over the years that we have been part of Bethel, which is about four or four and a half now, uh, allowing me to come on staff and, and uh, mentor um, and be an intern and um, just keep opening doors into new places for uh, me and uh, the gifting that God has called me to. I'm greatly appreciative. And um, again, for all of you, many places and, and things that you've said over the years to me, uh, things you've spoke over my life, belief that you've had in me uh, has left Mark in a really, really good way. I think so many times in our world today, we're really so caught up with everything else that we don't really remember the opportunity we have to bless somebody with the kindest of words. 
to build them up, encourage them, and tell them that they are going to make it, that they are more than enough, and that God in them is the hope of glory. And um, we have that opportunity every day within, or every moment that we are together with other believers. But how much more when the world out there is dead and dying? They're not getting a lot of good news these days, and they don't have a lot of projection of good news in, coming out of their hearts. So I think it's a great opportunity for us to be aware. And for those joining online, if you don't like the message, come back next week. Pastor Mike will be back. Okay. What's in your heart? Sounds like Samuel L. Jackson. What's in your wallet? I got to thinking, I think it was the only time he's ever put four words together that he hasn't had another superlative on the end of it. If you've watched any of his movies, he is quite prolific. But that's what I hear. What is in your heart with that same kind of intensity? Because out of the fullness of the heart, the mouth speaks. Out of the fullness of our heart, we act. And all that we have been created to be is a sum total of everything we believe are a priori, which really does dictate and lead us forward and or backwards. How we think about a thing is what the thing becomes to us, regardless of the truth of it, but that's what becomes. Generosity is one of those. You know, it can be a statement, am I generous? Our uh, question, am I generous? Or a statement, I am generous because I've been given everything. As you think about it, this for the rest of the week, this is one of the questions I want. I want you to ask yourself, am I generous? Am I generous in the way I talk to people? Am I generous in the way that I treat my spouse? I would guarantee you this, and Mike Friedrich would probably back me up on this, if men alone would die to themselves and serve their wives in a higher capacity, your marriage problems would go away. Because it comes from a stingy heart that you think that she should serve you, and vice versa. That's not the way this goes. Generosity is finding a way to outgive the other person before they can think of ways that they need it. Yeah. You ever seen a three-year-old? <laughs> Mine, right? <laughs> you want to get a glimpse of what hell could look like? Get a three-year-old sugared up, right? And, and all wrapped up on the one toy that they just got. And then go see somebody try and retrieve that toy from them. And the fight ensues. And the reason we're laughing is because we've all seen our children do it, or uh, we ourselves have done it. I would even say that uh, we're probably still doing it today. Mine. You can't have that. The response of sharing is really a response to God's heart and what we realize that we have been given. Because remember, he's not trying to take something, yet that he will replace it. Press down, shaken together, it will roll all over in your lap. And I'm going to tell you a story in a bit out of my own life where that has happened, and it has happened time and time and time again. And God doesn't love me more than he loves you. He is not a respecter of persons. So what he has done for me, he will actually do for you. Every time I fight with the concept of generosity, I am really fighting with my identity as a son or a daughter of God. So good. Yep. Pastor Mike said it earlier, you know, we have an identity problem in this country, and it is leading us to all kinds of struggle. But when we understand that we are image bearers, not of our parents, but of God himself, Scripture says we are made in his image. In fact, in Genesis, at the Genesis 2, let us make man in our image. And then he breathed into the dirt, and we became alive. I bear his image because he made me, and I have his breath because he breathed in me. And one of the greatest things in, I would have to think of is when you see a baby, and I remember I was in the room, and my oldest son came out, and that gasp before the breath, before the cry. That's the closest we get to heaven on earth. Because that's God. 
breathing life into that soul. I'm working on a series uh, beyond the generosity one that I've been writing down for a, a couple of years now. Things and acts that make us more like Jesus. And there are definitely many scripture teaches us, and they're not hard lessons of I got to give something up, but they're just responses to a love that surpasses understanding. One of them is generosity, the ability to give. I bear his image, I bear his breath. He is generous, therefore, we are called prophetically to be a generous people. Imagine that. Of all the things, the grace that is associated with that call to be prophetic by giving and being generous. Say with me, if you would, I am an image bearer. And I will be generous. I will be generous. Okay, you cannot be what you say unless you keep saying it to yourself. And I invite you to do that this week as well. Generosity is a perspective linked to my gratefulness. Have you ever thought about this? When I struggle with gratefulness, I also struggle with generosity because I always feel like I don't have enough. It doesn't matter how much I have. I could have a hundred dollars, I could have a thousand, I could have a hundred thousand, I could have several million. You know what? Generosity is, is not a state of my bank account or my investment account or when I look over the kingdom of what I think I've created. Generosity is something far different. It comes from gratefulness. When I realize that everything that I have been entrusted with, I don't own any of it is a gift from God. So the reason that I am not grateful is because I've gotten ownership backwards. The title on my life does not say Doug Fireisen, it says Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Once we get connected with the reality of ownership, it will change our heart towards generosity. It can do nothing less. This is where you should be amening. Because I'm preaching better than you're responding. Okay. Generosity is a noun. Giving is a verb. Generosity is a thing. But when I give, it now becomes an action. Pastor Mike just said to us, let's get our heads out of the clouds and get our hand on the plow. Let's grab the noun, the plow, and let's work it forward, right? But that, in working it forward, is a verb. Our faith is active. We are in an active reality. This isn't for a few to do the work of many. This is for many to do the work of the one, and that is Jesus. The definition of stewardship that I come up to, and um, this is my own, so you can throw it away. I wouldn't put this on wiki, but um, anyway, definition, generosity. The fullest expression of life lived as a wise steward. One who's been given a gift, that is salvation. Of time, talent, and treasure that is given wisely to glorify and honor God through loving his image bearers. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and love your brother as yourself. The more generous we are, I want to say one thing to you. Every dollar you have ever given to this house has went into building people. Either reaching the lost ones, loving into wholeness the saved ones, or bringing into fruition callings and giftings on the mature ones. Every one of the dollars. Part of my role here at the church is I'm director of business operations. I see the money. You are giving into fertile ground. And as a man of integrity, I would not say that to you if it was not true. I would skip that out of the sermon and I would go to something else. You need to hear that. 
We're not keeping it here. What we're doing is we're touching the world for Jesus Christ. Okay? And that's the purpose of all of our giving. So we're stewards. Let's look at David's life. He was a man of great generosity. He was a man of war. He was a man that uh, really had a heart after God. He said, a man after God's own heart. You know why he was a man after God's own heart? Because in Psalms 51, he talks about, it is you and you alone, God, that I have sinned against. It wasn't Bathsheba. It wasn't Uriah. Remember the story, Uriah? He sent him up to the front, had him killed virtually in battle because he had slept with Bathsheba. It was to God, he recognized it was to, against God that he had sinned. This man had been chased um, for 10 years by Saul and by his own son later in life. Absalom, Absalom. He was broken hearted over this broken relationship in which he, Absalom, his son, wanted to kill him. It comes from a place there when God delivered him in the Psalms and you read it time and time and time again. He lamented of the brokenness of the situation, but he always turned it around and realized that God was faithful. And it was out of that faithfulness and his gratefulness that his generosity took hold. And let's read it in 1 Chronicles 29, verses 1 through 3. Then King David said to the whole assembly, That's you. My son Solomon, the one whom God has chosen, is young and inexperienced. The task is great because his... Um, Palatial structure is not for man. This palatial structure is not for man, but for the Lord God. With all my resources, I will provide for the temple of my God. Gold for the gold work, silver for the silver, bronze for the bronze, iron for the iron, and wood for the wood, as well as onyx and stones and other settings, all for the temple. And in large quantities, Verse 3, besides, besides what has already been collected, which was worth billions, if you do the math, I won't give you the number, besides all of this, David says, in my devotion to the temple of my God, the place where God resided, I now give my personal treasures of gold and silver for the temple of my God, over and above everything that I have provided for his holy temple. Can you imagine what kind of extravagant generosity that is? That's like Bill Gates giving, giving this church all of his wealth. We're a temple, and we champion forward with it. That's billions and billions and billions of dollars. And he pushed it all in. He said, because you know what? God has done so much for me. How could I do any less for him? Amen. Remembering that building the temple was all about a structure. It was a place where God was going to live. It was an important place because the identification of Israel was centered around God's presence. Right. Being Christian is not a title. It's an experiential lifestyle that changes the temperature of everything that you do, every decision you make, everything that comes out of your mouth. Sometimes we do really good and sometimes we have to, Pastor Mike said, repent, start over, go back and move forward. His grace and his mercy is calling us to a better and more grand reality. And every time we do that, a greater level is deposited of his grace mercy, and our awareness of him in us, the hope of glory. Your generosity will build your faith. It will strengthen your inner man. And the things you were struggling with start to dissipate and go away. I love, I love our, our ministries here. I mean, we have Victory Weekend, and we have Soul Restore, and, and we have RTS. We have a lot of things that I am convinced are incredibly empowering to raise people up 
to help them walk through broken times and see God afresh and anew in the moment where they can again heal appropriately. Because life is rough, right? Let's be real, it's, it's rough. But I would also say that there is a level of disobedience even within us as a people group, as a family, that is keeping you in a cycle and a circle of your own choosing. When we choose to walk disobediently, there are consequences to our sin. We will lack hope, we will lack joy, we will lack peace, right? These are lack words, they're not generous words, because sin never comes to give you something better. It comes to take what was good and take it to a new diabolical lower place. Do not be deceived. If it's not good, it's because the enemy's fingerprints are all over this event. Our disobedience is our choice to either choose God and walk in his statues, in his ways, in his precepts and concepts, in his generosity that will surpass our imagination, or we can continue to be disobedient and not yield to the call of God on our life. And there will be a cost. Either way, you're going to get something from it. One is in abundance. One is going to continue to be lack. I love you too much to let you do that. Please hear the word of the Lord. These aren't my words. David's act was so dynamic that it actually changed all of Israel. It says in verse 6 that all of the leaders, they pressed in, they gave everything that they had. In verse 9, it then says, oh, I'm... I, I, Get the last part of verse 6 here, if it's up on the screen. It says, Officials in charge of the king's work gave willingly. Not under compulsion, not the church wants my money, here we go again. No. No, 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 no. Willingly. The people rejoice at the willing response of their leaders, for they, the people, had given freely, wholeheartedly, all in, Amen. right? Now, there's some of us who have maybe been at a gambling table before, and you feel really, really lucky, in your, and you push it all in, right? <laughs> Imagine. That's exactly what they did. But it wasn't just David. It wasn't just the, the leaders and the generals, but it was the everyday people that had encountered the golden age of Israel in which David had created peace in the kingdom and in the region which in the first time for hundreds of years that had happened and it was out of that reality that they give generosity is not about my money say this with me generosity is not about my money Man, that was a dirge. <laughs> Generosity is not about my money. But my money is part of being generous, which will affect my money, as we see in David's story. It cannot. You can't decipher them, right? You can't cut it apart. At the age of 20, I was called into the ministry, and I really struggled with that call because it was not a burning bush, but it was a vision that I had. And I saw a wheat field, and on the ends of each one of the shafts was a face. They're from all over the world. And I looked a second time, and they were crying. They were weeping. And right on the heels of that, God's, I got the scripture, the harvest is plenty, the workers are few. Beseech the Lord of the harvest that you will be sent out. I had to go to my mother at the time. I was 20 years old. I was home on leave from the army. I had to go to my mom and ask. I read the scripture. It was exactly what came. And I go, okay. 
I then come back a year later into 27% unemployment in my small hometown on the Oregon coast. Two weeks later, got a job making exactly what I had prayed about. I worked so much within the ensuing few months before I was ready to go to college up at uh, Northwest Bible College in Kirkland, Washington, that I actually had to quit to get any time off. It was amazing because God's call always comes with God's provision. Everything he's called you to be, a parent, right? A son, a daughter, a Christian, everything. The provision's already there, okay? You're just not walking in it if you're feeling lack. So it was at that point, I went to school, same uh, college that Pastor Kevin and, and uh, Kelly went to, Northwest Bible College. We were there at the same time, unfortunately, did not know each other. And uh, we laugh about that today, you know, how could that happen? But it did. I got through that and then later on started a church with a, uh, uh, somebody that I saw uh, up front that was starting a church in Kent. I went down there. It was amazing. We started with 80 people from a large church. After a year, they dropped us, and we went by the wayside on our own. Um, but in that moment of time, in the next three years, we went from 80 people up to 450. Now, get this. We were all in our late 20s. Now, that was a train wreck waiting to happen. And it wasn't because we were bad men, but, you know, you don't know what you don't know. And we were really green, and we had great hearts for God. And to, to, this is so funny. You know Dr. Greg Mitchell. Well, I was involved with prayer teams. We were going to Canada, and Bob Birch was part of that, and that was Pastor Greg's pastor. I didn't know that either, but that, that's a sidelight. Well, what ended up happening is we went from 450 down to zero, and the church ended up closing. And... Uh, in that devastation, other things were happening on my backside, and I, I blew apart. And uh, I walked away from my marriage because it was just too tough. Started all over again at 36 years old, and then I'm a manager at Boeing, so I got 38 union people that are working for me, and I'm working a lot, and I'm making good money at this point. And uh, in fact, I went 41 days straight, uh, 10 and 12 hours a day. That was Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, all around that. And we would get up and be at work at 4 in the morning, which means I was getting up at 2. And I was doing that, and I did it for 41 days straight. Because as I was going into my broken phase, a little bit more was going to be better, and I didn't know who I was. My identity was, was just not formed. It was the biggest flaw in my whole life. Because without identity, you really can't define your integrity. Now, I never lied or stole or did a lot of those things, but there was something in there that preempted me from really understanding who I was, and I really sought to fill that void, and I did it through stuff. So in that 41 days period, my take-home pay in that two-week period of time, or whatever it was, two-and-a-half-week period of time, was just around $15,000. This was in 1996. That was a lot of money today. That was a screaming amount of money back then. From there, I decided, well, this is good, but I really don't want to be in an environment like the Boeing Company. That's where I was working, uh, building airplanes. I really want something a little more glamorous. I see myself wearing a suit. I found a job as a financial advisor. They trained me. Within 18 months, I become a district manager, and I start on a road of building a district out while working my own practice. And what ended up happening is I went from no income, right, to within 18 months, I was doing okay, but then I started working in management and got in, getting overrides. Next thing you know, I am making a hundred and some thousand dollars a year, and it went from like literally zero to a bunch just a little bit overnight. At the same time, my wife, um, I'd gotten remarried, my wife at the point, um, she'd finished nursing school and uh, went to work for the uh, um, trauma center up in Seattle. And then she jumped up to a nurse manager of neurosurgery. And between the two of us, we're making 200,000 plus. And the kids are all gone. And so we felt like teenagers with a whole lot of money and we weren't serving Jesus, so it was all about us. And because we were broken, and the proclivity was that if you have stuff, then you're somebody. That's what we did. We bought the house that today, if you went to look at it on Zillow, is worth just under $3 million. I had two European cars. They were rock star cars. These were not just cars. These were beautiful automobiles in my driveway. 
Every year I was going to Mexico and or the Caribbean on a cruise or some major trip. On the weekends, we'd spend a couple of $300 going out to dinner with friends. Think nothing of it. Oh, and then because the pain couldn't get any worse, buy a boat. So we bought a 37-footer, and that wasn't big enough, and we really started cruising a lot, so then we bought a 52-footer, and boy, oh boy, we have arrived. Look at us. It was a beautiful boat, had a lot of great memories, I had a lot of great times, but here's how that went. So it was $50,000 for me to house that stupid thing, because I had covered mortgage and um, upkeep and, you know, a payment, you know, because I didn't have the cash to pay for the thing, so I had a payment, I had insurance, I had all these things going on. Well, then... You got to put diesel in it, start the motor. It burned 20 plus gallons an hour at four bucks a gallon then, and that took me about 12 nautical miles up the road. And we would go to the San Juan Islands 60 miles away, up and back in a four day weekend and think nothing of it. Long story short, living that life was good for three or four years. And then there was repercussions because 0809 and the financial crisis happened. At that point, I had left management, and now I was with one of the top 20 financial planning firms in all of Ameriprise Financial. There were 11,000 groups, and we were number 20. Managing money, working with clients, working with some of the best in the company, and uh, boy, you want to talk about access? I had some access. And then we went into that phase and it started to just crush me because I was living on cash flow. I wasn't living on true wealth. I wasn't living on true wealth because I had rebelled against God. I had walked away. I said, you know what? I'm gonna become the God of my own image. I'm going to make an image for myself and it's going to be defined by my boat, my car, my clothes, everything that I do. And I made people feel really small. because I was just mean-spirited and I was not generous. It was after that that the crushing of 08, 09, my income went in half, my bills did not. Wife and I were not getting along very well, I can imagine. A lot of selfishness on my part, I'll just take my part of it. And uh, next thing you know, I find out my marriage is over. Now, this is a man called on his life. Now I've gone through two, and I'm grieving because the shame of that was stifling. We were living on the boat. In fact, we'd pull our boat out of the slip and look right up at, Lake, uh, um, uh, at the Space Needle. We were downtown Seattle, beautiful property, uh, beautiful space to have the boat, great experience. All of a sudden, I'm packing off. At 50 years old, five bags of clothes, and about $5,000 worth of debt, and I gave her the boat, and I gave her everything else, and I walked away, and six weeks later, in fact, let me back up. There's somebody here today who's a good friend. He said, why don't you come live with us? You can live in our basement, and it wasn't a dinky basement, right, by any means, it was a very nice space, but that was an act of kindness. That gave me a footing to move forward. But here's what happened even though I had a place to live now. I had a stroke. I couldn't read. I couldn't write. I couldn't talk. Oh, that's right. I'm a financial advisor in a top 20 firm. And then I went into a fear spiral that I can't even begin to explain to you. I had less than $50,000 to my name. Everything that I'd worked for was gone. My second marriage was devastated. And the only thing that I heard was Holy Spirit whispering in this ear, city church, city church, city church. I could not get away from it. I knew where city church was, but that was the one church that kept ringing in my ear. And finally, I went there, and then it was that I had the stroke. And as I'm recovering out of that stroke, They said, you'll recover, you'll have a full recovery, but I was in Lululand for about a year. So I had to leave the practice and I went to work for another firm and somehow I couldn't even read the application and I was able to fill it out. They hired me and within a year, by God's grace, going back to church and hearing this message, 
the best is yet to come. Your call is never revoked. Your call is never revoked. I will pay back sevenfold everything the enemy has come to devour. Right? God is for you. He's not against you. And there is grace and abundance because he is good. And I started to heal in my brokenness, and it took time, and I went a little left, and I went a little right, and I didn't do everything right. It wasn't this like a road to Emmaus moment where all of a sudden I stopped and became a righteous man. It was a process. But there became a point where the Lord really spoke to me as I was praying, God, you know, bring somebody into my life. And he said, that's my daughter, number one, that you want. Number two is be the man that deserves the woman that you're praying for. Now, that sounds so unspiritual, but the reality of it is, as I begin to take things serious about my call and about my relationships, the restoration began to happen. Chronicles 29, 1 through, uh, 11 through, uh, through 14. Yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the majesty and the splendor for everything in heaven and earth is yours. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom. You are exalted as head over all. Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler over all things. In your hands are strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. Now, our God, we give you thanks and praise your glorious name. But who am I and who are my people that we should be able to give as generously as this? Everything comes from you. We have given and only what has come to our hands. The celebration when you realize it's all his. It takes the worry and the stress off of losing anything because if God has given it to you, there is no sorrow with his gifts. But if you've given it to yourself, it might be a training field. That's why we choose obedience instead of disobedience. Because there are times our decisions, just like mine, are going to hurt. Now, building a temple today is different, right? It's not about buildings. It's not about those kinds of things. Although, we do need those spaces because they're intentionally set up for people. You and people who have yet to find us and yet to find Jesus as our Lord and Savior. They're coming. We're growing. And we have only begun. Prophetic word after prophetic word says that this is going to grow and grow and grow and grow and grow. Haggai says in 2 verse 9 that the latter house will be greater than the former. That the temple as David with all of the gold and all of the wealth and everything that was put in it for the presence of God, right, was going to be superseded by this new temple. That new temple is spoke of by Paul in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 to 22. So now, my Gentiles are no longer strangers and foreigners. You are citizens, along with all of God's holy people. You are members of God's family. Together, we are his house, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. And the cornerstone is Jesus Christ himself. We are carefully joined together. We. You are not here by accident, even if you're visiting. There are no accidents. This is Holy Spirit driven. Everybody that needed to hear this is here. We together are being put together into a dwelling for God. Verse 22, through him, 
the Gentiles, are also being made part of it, that's us, Gentiles, of the dwelling where God lives by his spirit. We are the temple. We bear his image and we are his temple. That's why when we go out into the dead and dying world and we speak peace over people, we pray for people, we love people, no matter their station in life, we're more like Jesus. When we give to somebody and we never count it back, we're more like Jesus because generosity is the heart of the Father. For God so loved, he gave lavishly he is given so in closing I want to tell you some statistical facts in America the evangelical church in aggregate we make 5.2 trillion dollars every year of income 5.2 trillion dollars Tithe on that, 10%, which personally I am a believer of. I think that's where we start. That's not where we end. That's, the, that's kind of the table stakes. That's where you kind of enter into this reality, not where you end it. Um, and so from 10, we're going to 15, we're going to 20, we're going to, we're going to 50%. It doesn't matter because you can't give more than God's going to give back. It just doesn't work that way. But I'm not given to get. I'm given because I'm commanded to be generous. And I'm allowed, even more so, the invitation to be generous. So, if you took the tithe on that of just 10%, that would be about $500 billion a year coming into charity and the church. Right now, it's about 1.2% is the giving of the evangelical church. Another Barnum study. The millennial generation, you do not tithe. If you are a tither, you're the anomaly. All of the people with gray hair, no hair, and some hair are the ones paying the bills to propagate the gospel going forward. And I challenge you, if you are in that generation, there is a spirit of mammon on you and selfishness that there is redemptive hope for that will be up here. You can pray with somebody. You can go to an RTF. You can actually get to the bottom of it and stop living in disobedience and start honoring God with everything that you have, not just your vocal cords. So I'm speaking to a few groups today. One is the person who has never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. God so loved he gave. He made a way where there was no way you cannot perform yourself into the kingdom of God. It is impossible. There is just no way that's going to happen. Relationships were broke because man chose to be disobedient. And when we choose to turn our back on the call, when we're given these opportunities, we again choose to go right back to the garden and we're going to be expelled out. It is unfortunate, but it is true. And I am, I am crying out, don't do that to yourself. Jesus loves you too much. You have no idea what you're missing out on. Where Satan always says, oh, God's holding out on you, I'm telling you, he's not. You're holding out on you because if you just walk through salvation's door, you will begin to experience a peace, a joy, a love, something that you've never had to the fullness and to the depth. And every believer in here said, Amen. The second group. You've never tithed. Maybe you're the millennial, maybe you're below, maybe you're even younger, maybe you're 15 years old and it's your first job or you get an allowance. You still have the opportunity to start a discipline that will carry you for the rest of your life. And I know men and women, in fact, I got hit, uh, not hit, I was talking to one last night, he came up to me at, at an event, uh, I'm sorry, it was uh, Friday, and he says, you know what, da 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 talking about this business thing, and he says, you know what, I'm going, I, I'm gonna give $50,000. It came out of nowhere. He didn't know I was speaking. He didn't even know what we were going to go into. His heart, you should see the look on his face. He was like a little kid at Christmas. I'm going to get to give $50,000. That is the heart of generosity. That spoke to me, and I walked away, and I go, Lord God. Lord God, may that spirit pervade 
our brokenness. So if you are not a giver, I'm going to invite you to con not to consider, to start walking in obedience because as soon as you do, other authority will fall in your life that has been missing. Okay? I know this. You have the third group and you, you tip God, probably not even 18%, but when you get around to it, if you feel like it, and oh, well, you know, Pastor Mike did a good job, I'll throw him a buck or two, yeah. You know, that's kind of a really stingy, miserly kind of attitude and spirit. Again, that just doesn't speak to what we've talked about this morning, nor the heart of God. I'm inviting you to start walking faithfully in what you have started but you, for some reason, find accountability partner. Talk to your life group and walk forward and have them hold you accountable so that you can grow and become part of the solution in other people's lives instead of constantly being the one with their hand out and their heart in a mess. The last group of people are those who have tithed and found it faithfully. I know, um, again, I honor my mom again because that's what I saw at home. And I saw offerings. I saw back in times, you know, things they give. And they weren't wealthy. My dad had a big heart. He loved to give. If you've been tithing, I'm going to invite you into a new expression of faith, opportunity, and blessing. What else is it? Is it your time? Your treasure? and your talent? Have you sanctified those? Are you using those for God's glory? For I'm asking you to consider taking just your tithe and going into offerings and see what God will do. I've experienced it time and time again. I don't have a, a, another time, another sermon. I will tell you the rest of the story since the restoration of marriage and things going on. It is stupefying. I had nothing 13 years ago, and I am retired as of a year and a half ago. Come on. Your time matters, your talents matter, and your treasure matters, because each one of those is a gift that God has given you according to what we read, which means when you lay it back down at his feet, you honor him with all of who you are. That kind of people of generosity will rock Chandler, Gilbert, and this Southeast Valley for Jesus in a way you can even imagine Let's be those people. Father, I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your mercy. I thank you for your abundant love. Lord, you just, just are all over us constantly with your presence about how good you are. Lord, I pray for those that have never accepted you, Father, that again, they will come forward and accept you for the first time. I pray for those that are struggling in their different phases of their own selfishness and inability to trust you, Lord, that they will again you will give them the faith to test and see that you are good. And for those that are inconsistent, Father, would you raise them up and make them true disciples of the cross? And will they give to you instead of giving to themselves? And lastly, Father, would you just supernaturally bless those givers that have been faithful for year over year over year? Will you multiply their impact of time? Will you multiply their impact of talent? Would you impact, uh, multiply the impact of their resources? And allow them to give, because freely it has been given, so freely we give back to you to honor Jesus in all that we say or do. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.